everybody. Welcome to Bits and Bites. This is uh, CCI's non-threatening, gentle, and lovely introduction to creative technologies with people that I think are both inspiring and interesting in the field. And I'm super excited to introduce you to Helen Lee today, who is fantastic. Uh, Helen Lee Stern. Um, it's going to be exciting and fun, and she makes absolutely beautiful wearables and instruments. She's worked with creators such as Emotion Heap and the BBC to produce things that are really uh, amazing. She's also made tons of really beautiful electronics, like a disco ball theremin and insect-like creatures that have capacitive... Um, bits coming out. They're just like metal bits that stick out and you can touch them and it makes noise. And one of my favorite projects is your cuddly toy that you hug that helps you feel less anxious. Uh, so I think it's going to be really interesting for you all to hear from Helen because she's written several books in creative technologies and she's at a point in her career now where I feel she has hit a really successful place. Like she's writing for Hackspace and Make Magazine and everyone else. And now I think you're kind of inspirational to others who are getting started. And that must feel really cool and really fun. And I think you have a lot to share with us today. Okay, I hope, I hope so. to live up to that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll start with my first question. I want you to tell me how you got into creative technology and how you ended up here. That's really interesting because I don't necessarily see creative tech. I mean, that's the thing that most people would describe me as, as a creative technologist, right? But um, I don't really necessarily see myself as a creative technologist. Just, you know, I don't see myself as an like a proper engineer, whatever that means. I uh, just mean different things in different countries and in different um, systems. Um, I would say that I use technology as a tool, um, rather as my, um, my it's, it's not like technology isn't the thing that gets me up in the morning, right? Like I do enjoy technology a lot. It's, some, it's, um, it's really fun, but I would say that my primary purpose is not using technology, understanding technology or manipulating technology. It's simply using lots of different technologies, almost like a, um, a fun buffet of things that I can try. I'll be like, ooh, I'll try some electronics from here. I'll try this artistic practice from here. So for me, technology is one of many, many different skills um, that, that I employ in my work. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't not describe myself as a creative technologist. I have done that. But as I'm talking to other technologists, I think it's really important to say um, that, that very much that um, I would say I'm about, about 50% with the technology. The rest of it is, um, is, is other skills, um, these, these skills that are less, less valued by some, but um, greatly valued by me. Um, it's a collaboration between the, the the different kind of spheres of influence in my life, of when, of which um, technology is a cornerstone. But as to how I got into technology, um, it's a very different story to the one that's typically told uh, around people in my field, like in the ha hardware hacking field. Um, you'll often hear interviews with people and they say, when I was four, I had this speaking spell, and I broke it apart, and I smashed it apart with my, with my baby screwdriver. You know, like I've been hacking, I've been coding, I've been making since I was a little baby. It just came natural to me. Like I love to make and break things, take things apart, blah blah blah. You know, that wasn't me at all. Um, I was actually super into literature and languages when uh, when I was young. Um, you know, and, and part of that is, you know, like the, um, I didn't grow up, you know, like technology and where I grew up was you learned how to type in school, right? There was no like, no such thing as interesting technology studies back then. It was like, can you make a flow chart and can you touch type? And frankly, I wasn't particularly interested in, in, in the creative possibilities of either of those things. So I'd say that, it wasn't until we were into, until post Arduino, I'd say, was when I first started doing creative technology. Because that really, that was the point at when 
it was possible to start doing creative technology for people who weren't already engineers. So um, in the years that I've been practicing, like that I've been working with technology in my practice, um, it's become just so much easier, even during the time that I've been working with it. So um, yeah, post Arduino, um, when I was, um, I got involved in a hackerspace in London um, and started fiddling around with the laser cutter. And I was very excited to see how something that seemed very daunting was actually incredibly simple to use. And that was my, I guess, what you'd call a gateway drug, right? It's the gateway drug for a lot of makers, is kind of learning how to use a, a laser cutter and going, actually, this isn't that hard, and I can do lots of really cool things with this. There's lots of applications there. Um, so yeah, through hacking, through making, but also um, I got into creative technology very much through the microcontroller world, which was made possible um, by the success and the increasing ease of Arduino and platforms such as Arduino. So that was a, a fairly long rambling um, <clears throat> question, um, answer to your question. But yeah, so um, microcontrollers and laser cutting and were my gateway drugs. Well, you brought up so many interesting things. I'm like, how, ah, where do I even go? Where do I even start? I think the most interesting thing for me that you raised there is process and how important process is to you and like how important it is for you to be able to think about your process and think about how that relates to like the creative possibilities you come up with. So maybe I think the thing that I thought um, from your work that is got to be really process driven is your bug, your tentacled spiky creature. So this is, um, my pet tentacle. Um, it's entirely made of plush. If you open it up, you'll see a couple of wires, but it's mostly, um, like the insides of a teddy bear. Um, and I made it I made this version of it back at the beginning of the pandemic when I was feeling very anxious and I hadn't seen anyone for a long time and I just wanted to cuddle somebody. So I made a giant um, plushy tentacle, nice and soothing and sweet. It's very squishy as you can see, but it interacts. So basically when I'm stroking it or if I'm squishing it or if I'm you know lightly stroking it or really giving it a squeeze, it reacts in different ways. Um, the first thing I put on there um, is um, I wanted it to be like quite a personal experience. So I put headphones into into my little tentacle here and listen to them. And then when I stroke it softly, it purrs to me. So it's like this really comforting, bassy purr. Um, but in terms of the process of this, this was... Um, this was actually this actually started out life as a study for a much larger piece, and um, so this was actually quite different to the process that I would normally take for for my for my other things. And um, I was just playing around. In fact, this you know what? No, it isn't. It's exactly the same. What it is is I found a material that I really enjoyed. Right. So there's two materials that I really like here. I saw this in a fabric shop. This you can't necessarily see it. It's a lovely textured cotton, and it feels really nice. And then the other thing here is there's um, this is this 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 uh, zigzag stitch here. This is what gives the creature like the tentacle its shape, it gives you its hugging shape. But what it also is is I've used a particular type of thread in this, which is conductive thread. So this functions as a capacitive sensing input. Um, but I just bought this new type of thread, which was um, which had just been made um, available to me. Um, it's like, um, but, but the thing that's special about it is that um, normally when you're using threads, um, conductive thread, like the old fashioned uh, threads, as I'm sure you know, or a lot of them were very bad, you know, like very hairy, it was like short circuit city, or they would snap, or you, you couldn't use it in the, in the sewing machine, blah, blah, blah. But I got this new stuff that I use in my tentacle that was like super nice, like super nice, like a really nice material. You can use it in the top thread and the bottom thread of a sewing machine. So it worked really, really nicely, super smooth, just like th sewing with normal thread, no, no mucking around. So I had these two things. I was like this beautiful pillowy cotton and then this really interesting new tool, right? It's essentially, it's a new way of using conductive thread. 
Um, so I decided to start mucking around with it and see what happens. And I made this thing, and I thought it was just going to be a study for a much larger piece that I had in my mind. But I took that thing, the original prototype of it, not this particular one, um, I took it to, um, so there's a hacker festival um, outside Berlin called CCC that happens, well CCC is the organization, the name of the festival is called Congress. It happens every year, I mean not this one, but every year between Christmas and New Year's and it's this huge like 30,000 hackers in a conference center having an amazing time. You must go, it's fantastic. But I took it around to that and everybody loved it so much like just people were queuing up to like touch it and like it just seemed to and people were actually getting emotional about it even um, and part and part of that was because I refused to let anyone put a speaker into it so it's a very personal experience I actually don't play the sound of the pairing out loud you can only hear the pairing if you put it into your ears and you stroke it you know, because it's a very personal experience. It's supposed to be an intimate experience. And something about that intimacy and the softness and the way that the tentacle holds you was extremely popular um, with people at this conference, um, even though I didn't think it was going to be anything. So I thought, mm, maybe there's something in this. And I started, um, I started making a few of them to test out the different huggability of them, the different, you know, the different, um, different functionality, that kind of stuff. But really, yeah, it was born of me having some interesting materials, which is often how I start my process, is I will, I'm very guided by material, like I'll go into an art shop or like an architecture supply shop or a, like, a, a, like a hardware stop, shop or whatever, places that you wouldn't necessarily buy electronics, and I'll go in with my multimeter and I will check to see if things are conductive or how conductive things are, and I will, like a little magpie, I will just collect interesting objects that are conductive that I can consider using in something later on. Um, and then just like with this, like I had this nice material, I had the nice thread, and I started to, in my mind, the, it was very materials-led. And the same with my giant circuit sculpture creatures. I'm always very materials-led in that way. Um, so yeah, I start with the materials, I make a couple of prototypes, I take it out, I let people use it, and then if people love it, then it's a win. If people are like, oh, okay, cool, then it's it's a dud. But, um, but yeah, I guess materials, prototyping, and then I'm just, I'm looking for an emotional reaction. Um, to the work that I do very much, like an emotional, tactile um, reaction. So, um, so yeah, I think actually, I didn't think that was a very good example of my process, but actually now I've said it out loud, it is quite a good example of my process. <laughs> that is such an interesting process. And I've been thinking a lot recently about method. And I, as you know, I'm doing this PhD and it basically weirdness, that would be the way I'd put it. If somebody had to ask me, what's your PhD about? I'd be like, making weird game controllers that bring me joy. And they'd be like, you're not an academic, you're a weirdo artist. And I'd be like, but I wrote a lot of words about it and I figured out a way to talk about it. And you know, it's this like total dance of like selling yourself in like all these different ways when you're an artist. So I've been thinking a lot about how artists, we really all generate methods and methodology every single time we work. And we all have these like methods that we've been using for a really long time. And they are what I, I, I hear from you when you're speaking about your work is that the tactileness of it is really important to you. So you let the tactile materiality really drive the creative outcome, which is super different than like a painter who's like, I'm going to make a painting about the Mona Lisa. As an artist and as a professional in your field, you do like mature and you do go through stages, right? And I still do feel, I mean, when we first met, I was very much like, you know, a freshman, you know, I was making my first sense, I was, you know, making my first like DIY kits, I didn't really know what I was doing, I didn't really have the skills that I do now. Um, and I, I've become a little bit more aware of my own learning journey, both as an artist and as like a, as a hacker. And I do feel like I'm getting more intentional with the stuff that I make. 
I'm making a lot more stories around the stuff that I make. When you first start out, you make a lot of projects that are literally just like, essentially trying trying out how to use a sensor, right? Trying out, you're not really thinking about the beauty or the message or the originality of it. And that's, you know, like that's part of the learning process. And I feel like I've come out of that beginner stage for, 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 for sure. Um, however, I still do feel very much, um, it was really interesting to me to hear you introduce me at the beginning of this. I was like, oh yeah, I sound really cool. And I was like, well, all of the things she's saying, they're actually true. Um, <laughs> so it's just kind of like, I guess I'm in that that, that like middle stage of like, oh yeah, no, I, have, I have got some good skills and I have done some really interesting work and some really interesting projects. But the way that my mind is at the moment, I'm suddenly, I'm starting to think like, where can I take this next? I feel so intermediate um, in, in all of these things, but I think that's like partially a journey you, you take, if you understand what I mean. It's like part of your life's creative process. Um, like, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't feel like my process is fully honed yet, but I do definitely feel like I am establishing one, that's for sure. It was an interesting thing for me to, um, to consider is that yes I do have a process but in my own mind it's still like there's still so far for me to go both in terms of my skill attainment and also in terms of my um, my artistic thoughts I would say and um, because I'm not a trained artist like you know I'm not a trained artist and um, so I do feel sometimes that I um, I could be more mature in, in the objects that I'm creating, around the thought processes around them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I guess that's part of the, the process in itself, yeah. isn't it? Uh, Re-evaluating your work. Um, the more you get into, uh, you know, the more you get into a subject area, the more you're... Um, the more you're aware of the work of your peers, I guess. And then when you get to a point where you understand what your peers are doing, suddenly your your first your first forays into art making seem like crude mark making compared to the masters, but of course you're comparing yourself to the masters who you now know exist. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to do is say, please don't ever change the way that you approach things because you're you're generating knowledge through process, right? And I think that that's actually really valuable because the knowledge you generate out of that process is very, very valuable to like creative research. And also beyond that, like you can deprioritize what has traditionally been valued in Western culture, which is this like kind of cognitivist way to go into things like, you know, how I think needs to be this like analytical because knowledge doesn't come about that way. Like it that that's a wrapper, I think, that gets wrapped around knowledge often because like you listen to really good scientists talk and even if they use like scientific method, it's never I have had an idea. You know, it's like I was futzing in the lab and then my scalpel slipped and knocked over a vial and you know like it's so much more like that kind of thing right it's a lot more organic it's a lot more organic than than you'd think actually yeah it's true it's true yeah. i mean all of my best ideas have been kind of somewhat accidental but then you know the 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 process that takes you to the finished version of that that's the thing that's not accidental that's the thing that's intentional but the a lot of the ideas that i have are informed by um, just daydreams accidents, mishaps. And I think that's one of the joys of having, of doing like mixed media stuff, right? Um, as opposed to like, if I was just, just like an electronics engineer, there's a lot more of a, a path, right? You want this thing, you've got to do these things. But because a lot of the things that I'm working on, I mean like there have been, to my knowledge, no other um, singing tentacles that's t sense when you touch them. You know, like there's not an established path to get to the thing that I want to create in most cases. And you can see my, mm -hmm. my theremin there behind me, my embroidery hoop microphone. Like a lot of the things that I do make are quite, um, yeah, experimental, I'd say. So um, it's, it's quite nice to have, to ha like I'd say, like I'm, 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 you know, like I'm a decent sewer, I'm decent at electronics, like I'm decent at lots of little things, but I'm not like, a one expert at like one thing, if you know what I mean. But that means that my pr practice is a lot broader, um, and it does mean that I'm able to just experiment. I'm just able to like take two things that I think are cool, like the thread and the 
fabric or what or like a disco ball and a theremin and I just kind of like smush them together and then see if they look cool or have some kind of emotional impact or if they do not and sometimes reader they do not sometimes they suck and that's okay <laughs> That's totally okay. I mean, it's like a validation criteria, right? You have a validation criteria for the data you're generating. And I, I think that's really valuable and really important. Uh, I read this book recently that I'm going to throw at you. And, and you, you have to go meet this, uh, this person. You have to tell me all about what they're like. But it's called Critical Fabulations. And in it, they talk about um, their process of generating knowledge and how they go about it is so different than like traditional design methodologies. It actually kind of comes up alongside them and proposes, hey, well, maybe instead of like standing outside of a community and diagnosing what's going on in it, you actually like participate in it and you become part of it and you maybe contribute back to it. <laughs> Just this wild idea. <laughs> and I think it's like, really interesting how like just now writers like that are starting to establish methodologies or like they're starting to write down like hey this is this method that i'm using that let me generate or like come to all these amazing understandings that i wouldn't have come to had i just said okay now i'm gonna make an let matrix what's the next hardest project a lot of people when they're starting it they don't necessarily realize that it's not about having the most features and it's not about having um the, the best integration of, of a particular type of technology. It's literally about imagination and joy yeah. um, and having an impact on people. Yeah. Um, and I would, it comes back to the idea of technology as a tool rather than a means to an end, right? So what are you using this technology for? I mean, like what a stupid nebulous word, technology, like, you know, <laughs> what like what are you talking about here like because you know i've got no idea how to run a web server but i can make a robot like the bit you know like this is just such a big, big broad umbrella of things and it's so impossible to say like that that's the outcome right you, you learn those things to, yeah. to do a thing and i think that's very I think it's because the idea of technology as well as like such a can be such an intimidating concept um, that I think you're fo more focused on the nuts and bolts than you are on the actual creation sometimes when you're when you're learning these things we've all been there um, but it's more it's more exciting um, and more useful for humanity to have something that is you know, something that brings joy or something that has purpose um, or stretches your um, creative muscles as well as your as well as your intellectual muscles. Not that they're opposites or anything, but um, yeah, I think I think that's um, that that can that can be something that that my students certainly and your students probably um, struggle with in terms of marrying technology and creativity. I think it is definitely something I see particularly new artists that have come into it or new technologists who want to learn art. Like the new technologists that I have that want to learn art are kind of a little flummoxed. They're like, what, where? Um, and often I get artists that just pick stuff up and like within six to eight months, they've gone like way ahead of the technologists because they're just like, I'm going to tack this thing onto that thing and glue this thing and you know and their skills they they accrue knowledge in a, such a different way and eventually the technology person realizes this, that they're actually studying like art and design like they have to like really reformulate how they frame things but what i i, I think this is is more about fictioning right so like what we're doing here is every time we create a piece of work we're proposing a fiction right a kind of way that you could be in the world with this technology. And I think that's really valuable. I, I, I like to remind people that cyberspace was invented by a novelist, not by a technologist in a room. <laughs> so, so many of like Star Trek, right? Our communicator, our, our lovely communicators that we carry around with us. Uh, where did this idea come from? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Science fiction is incredibly important to technology. It gives, imagination is incredibly important to technology. 
definitely yeah no it's 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 not it's not it's not easy to to overstate that impact i agree i fully agree (laughs) yeah so like i i think maybe if i had to ask you what's the story behind some of your works that's weaving together describe for me the world in which everyone has one of these huggy things and everyone has one of your gesture gloves and everyone has one of your like capacitive uh theremin things like what's the world look like where this technology is just everywhere so i don't want everybody to have my technology what i want people to do is to create their own um so i have two answers to this question and one of which is the fairy tale land in which a lot of the inventions that i make live um in my head Mm -hmm. which is just uh, my my little daydream and populated by my strange yeah things and um, I should I should say as well for, for people who aren't familiar with my work that most of my objects that I make certainly in recent times um, are all instruments um, of varying sorts. But last year I did a residency in Denmark um, and um, I spent a month um, actually thinking about this um, and and making objects that would, would populate this, but. Um, so it's funny you should mention Star Trek because um, it's actually a very big inspiration of mine, particularly the next generation is a huge inspiration uh, for me. Um, partially because um, I grew up with it, but also because um, as a technologist, yeah, you do um, look to sci- science fiction a lot. And for me, Star Trek is the only true utopia. Um, if you see what I mean, you know, like bad things happen, right? But everybody's got good intentions, mostly, you know. Um, they've eradicated um, a lot of the modern uh, societal ills. Um, and it's really nice. It's, I find myself binge watching it when I was having trouble because um, it's just really nice to have to like imagine that you live in this world where everything. You know, like nobody's hungry. Um, you know, like a lot of the societal ills that we that we are suffering just don't exist in the Star Wars universe. So I love I love the utopian nature of of Star Trek, and I was actually getting a bit annoyed by a bunch of Star Trek that I was watching that was like really macho and like you know like punching aliens in the face. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, everybody likes a bit of that. You know, um, but I was a bit sick of all the dystopias that we have in science fiction. So a lot of the work that I make is quite utopian um, in nature, and, and that's with the sounds and the kind of... So actually, the, the, my, my strange tentacle, here we are, like it's, it's actually quite a good example of this. And the, I, I wanted it to be like well-meaning and kind and soft and nurturing and, um, and, and it sounds beautiful like it's all kind of like you're enveloped in the softness and kindness and all of the other creatures that I make all of the other instruments that I make um, and like a lot of other sound artists um, um, I don't make discordant things um, and I don't make a lot of the, the sounds that I use are not experimental in nature I make um, very kind of beautiful um, harmonious sounding creatures because I kind of imagine them populating this like world where everything looks a bit peculiar but everything's got wonderful nice intentions and things sound nice and feel nice and are, are nice to each other so I mean yeah it's like this kind of like slightly plush slightly sparkly science fiction utopia um is is the imaginary daydream world that i come up with that i that i place all my objects in um but but in terms of like the the world that other people would inhabit um if they were to create my so my 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 core thought around this is yes i love making my creatures i love making this thing but um, but this is very much a product of my own imagination, right? You know, like I don't think there's a mass market for cuddly tentacles. I mean, I might be wrong, but you know, maybe there, m- maybe there is. But um, <laughs> but but my my objective is not for there to for everybody to have a tentacle. My objective is for people to, through the ridiculousness of my creations and the pure flights of fantasy that I allow myself to go on, is to remind people that all music is made up right all instruments are invented um, I'm making these ridiculous um, objects that are experimental musical instruments and you know like 
until until I guess the 1930s and 1940s, there was a lot the, the, the homogenization <clears throat> of instrument making um, wasn't a thing. Like you go to an, um, a musical instrument um, um, museum, there's a really nice one in Berlin um, and, that I went to, and you see like all these hundreds of different types of like harpsichord, right? So there's no like centralized like now we think about a violin. A violin is a violin is a violin is violin right there are tweaks there's like small changes in from manufacturer to manufacturer but the truth is like a violin is a violin right whereas um back you know like a couple of hundred years ago like a violin was not a violin and like there was a lot more regional variation in between instruments and i think people forget because these instruments have been so established for so long that instruments didn't always used to be the same right um, like an, an, a middle A didn't used to be 430, 440 hertz until like the 1950s when a group of dudes decided that's what it was. It used to be different in different countries. So there used, there's like the homogenization of musical instrument making is actually quite a recent phenomenon. So partially through my instruments, I want to be like, hey, listen, you can also make your own instruments. And, and part of that is the flight of imagination. It's like, you know, if you want to make a, you know, say for example, you're like super into, I don't know, traffic cones, that's your aesthetic. You've got a very a traffic cone aesthetic and you also want to make an instrument and um, you, you can go on ahead and do that. So like partially it's like the, 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 the absurdity and the extreme Helen-ness of all my objects. They're very personal, right? So I wanted to make the point that all, yeah, yeah, all instruments are inventions, so you can do that yourself, but also I try very hard to document all of my makes um, so that they show how to use these different technologies. Um, so, um, so for example, the, the tentacle and the disc of the theremin is behind me, and they're actually part of um, a larger piece of work that I'm doing, um, is, which is an as yet untitled book on DIY music technologies, um, which, which is all about the different kinds of technologies, the different types of microcontrollers that you might want to use um, to make your own instruments. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess at the moment I do, I do think a lot about how um, the homogenization of 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 everything really, not just musical instruments, of everything. So like the, the kind of globalization. And in fact, I, at this at this um, instrument museum in Berlin, um, it was very empty because you know it was reduced reduced um, reduced out um, reduced number of people that can come in because of COVID. And I got um, essentially a private tour by one of the curators who was just showing people around. And she went on from this massive rant about globalization and how it had destroyed like like all these different like independent piano makers who had all these stuff. And it was really interesting. I'd not really thought about it before. Um, about, about the history of the harpsichord, right? I'm more of a synth person, you know, like I'm a bit more, a bit more modern. Um, but she went on this massive rant about like how her harpsichords were destroyed for political reasons. Um, because they, they were um, they were popular um, with the kings that were all beheaded during the revolution. So basically, it was considered. No, honestly, it was con like the harpsichord died out because it was considered bourgeois to have. It was considered like upper class to have it. And in fact, like um, one of the beheaded French kings, I forget which one, probably one of the Louis, wasn't it? Um, but. He um, he actually saw a demonstration of the grand of a grand piano and was like, no, it's terrible, blah blah blah. We like the harpsichord in this in this and like and then he got his head cut off, and the grand piano was seen as like a revolutionary instrument and became really popular with the uh, middle and upper class people. And all their harpsichords were um, were no longer in favour. Um, that was a bit of a tangent, wasn't it? But it's quite an interesting one. But you think like about these kind of trends. Um, and then, you know, not necessarily, actually, so that, for example, the, the harpsichord versus piano, that was not driven by technology, that change, which, I mean, it is a technology, right? These instruments are making use of technologies. And you see, like, 
Um, we go back to harpsichords, apparently. Um, but so we used to throw the, you know, the evolution of the different types of harpsichord that you have, right? Um, and then you look at the music that's created, and actually, a lot of the music that is created is created for the new technology, right? So, like, um, when you can get like these sharp, you know, bef before it used to have to be a little bit more slow and stately because those were the constraints of the tool, right? Of the constraints of the the instruments that they were playing. But as the technology got better and better, and as the harpsichord got more and more advanced, you were able to create much more, um, like much more like swift, um, you know, like the flight of the bumblebees, right? That wasn't that wasn't just. It was the first time anyone had ever thought of doing a lot of notes in one row. It was the first kind of time that people, you know, that the technology was available. You know, like the harpsichord was good enough. And, to, to be able to create that kind of music. So actually the technology drives the change in music as well as the other way. You know, so it's it's like a, it's it's like um it's not just um it's not purely artistic and it's not purely technological. We're kind of like locked in this like but not battle, but we're we're locked we're locked in this embrace, kind of like struggling our way through the future, you know, like um, increasing, like changing, changing our art as our technological tools change, and changing our tools as it as they um, as we need them for our art as well. And I think the harpsichord is a really nice example of that. And suddenly, this 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 like forward moving embrace through trying, you know, like art, music, art, music, technologies, um, is like brought to a crushing halt because some king didn't like the piano, and then got himself beheaded. Like, and it's so interesting to me, you know, that all of this can be like just stopped. Like, all of this progress, all of these, um, all of this knowledge is just is 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 is, um, is changed by by history and by politics. It's very very interesting and actually very relevant. Um, I think. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's kind of why I'm so interested in utopias, and I'm interested in fictioning new worlds because I personally think we're we're capitalists thinking is at its end. Like we're post-capitalist now, it's just not gonna work anymore. And we need new ways to be in the world. We need new solutions for like, who makes technology, what it's capable of doing. And we need to really break down a lot of that homogenization that we've seen from globalization and go back to thinking about how we solve the problems around us and who gets to solve them and why. We went through such a period of, of technology becoming, you know, starting by like heavily influenced by women, including women to this narrowing. And, and, and now we're literally at the peak of like fighting for like just basic things like, Hey, can we be here? And maybe you won't like leer at us. Like, could we just do that? Like, can we get that far? <laughs> um, and like, I, I think it's symptomatic of the world that's kind of come into, to, to Play. And like, I, I think that something like Arduino or something like these sensors, they're proposing an alternate world, right? They're proposing a world where technology is not terrifying. And like, if you've got an interest in making something for yourself, you totally can. I tell you who's interesting to look at with that is, um, well, they've closed now, but um, Cobra Count, you know Cobra Count. So, um, yes, so, so, so Cobra Count is K-O-B-A-K-A-N-T for those who are watching. Um, and they um, were a, well, are a Berlin-based atelier for um, e-textiles. But I don't know if you knew this, but the, one of the reasons why they founded it is it, it was um, and the, the, the studio that they ran, not the studio, but the pop-up shop that they ran, um, right. was based on a science fiction imagining, um, which was um, that in the future, um, all that the, there were the clothes would be um, and, and and electronics would be bespoke, right? So like there would be like an atelier for for clothing. There would also be an atelier for electronics, and that was the basis of Cobra Kent, the pop up shop in Villa's Park was imagining in the, in the so future. Much. Yeah, just imagining in the future that there would be like bespoke ateliers for electronics, and they had um, these things displayed on them. What about that? fascinating like their research is so good and if, and if anybody watching is into um wearables or into the idea of kind of conductive um fabrics or that kind of thing 
their website is an absolute treasure trove of information. It's um, it's 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 just it's where it's the wearables. It's the it's the website where all the wearables people go and like, how do you connect this thing to this thing? I mean, it's it's a little bit dated now, um, just in appearance, but the the information on there is absolutely absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so check them out. Well, I think this is all the things that I wanted to talk about in the very first Bits and Bytes episode. We have touched on all the topics of pure goodness, the importance of science fiction imagining to the creation of technology, the importance of valuing process and process-based methodologies to generate knowledge, uh, creative arts, not just being about being a technologist, but like using technology is just another thing in your toolbox that you can pull out, integrate into a thing. I, this has just been the best conversation. And it's reminded me so much why I love talking to you because we can get into these holes and it can go for hours. <laughs> Um, so I feel like I have to ask you now a very lighthearted question because we've been very serious and, and very philosophical and very, very interesting. But I want you to explain to me the your Welsh, which I think is a fun fact to know. I want you to tell me three ridiculous Welsh words. Oh, wow. Well, the one that everybody really loves is Pipti um, uh, Pong, which is my... <laughs> I love it. It's so good. <laughs> I love how much it like says what it does, you know? Um, not everybody uses that. Um, so my favorite Welsh mm -hmm. words, I would say, I've got, can I, can I say one sentence and then one word? Yes, you can say one sentence and one word, and I'm excited to hear what you choose. My favorite just all round word is bendigerdig. Um, firstly, because it's got the word bendy in there, it's hilarious. But bendy getting just means excellent. So be like, you know, how are you? Be like, bendy getting. Um, it's just, oh, I don't know, it's just a really, uh, it's a really cheerful, it's a cheerful word. Um, although, yeah, I don't know, it's a really cheerful word. But the, the other really nice cheerful word is kutch, um, which is C-W-T-C-H. And it means a cuddle. Um, and it's just a very specific type of platonic Cuddle. You can give it to your partner, you know, your, your, your love interest, but it's just like a really deep, like, non-sexual, loving cuddle that you might give to your friend on, at the end of the night. It's just like a really good hug, like a good hug between people who have love in their heart for each other. It's a kutch, like a proper kutch. That's nice. So my favorite sentence... Um, in Welsh, and bear in mind, like I'm from South Wales, so I'm not fluent in Welsh at all. So if there are any fluent Welsh speakers um, out there, please don't judge my accent. But I really like Rodwin Hofi Scordian or Scordian, which sounds quite lyrical, I think, but it means I like fish and chips. <laughs> so. Uh... <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, and I was totally expecting that. Redwin Hofi Skordion Askordion. Yeah. Skods Asklods is the short. It's like Skordion Askordion is fish and chips, or Skods Asklods is the shortened version of it. Very Helen. I feel like it just went very, very Helen there with the, the language you chose to uh, to love, which I, I, I think is delightful. And one of my favorite things that I, I think that we, you and I have gone back and forth on, and I think is the final thing I'm going to talk about during this show is a culture of care, which I think you and I have done a whole bunch of work with like fostering a culture of care about how the other one is like, just eat, like we can trade tech tips all day and I can write you and be like, Hey, what do you know about this? Blah, blah, blah. But really it's not what I'm interested in talking to you about, even though sometimes we do talk about that kind of stuff. Um, and for those of you who, who Helen and I were part of the same makerspace community for a while, which is how we became friends. And at that community, at, at that, at that space, which is just culture of care that I think is seeped into our relationship. And it just becomes, it was such a different space because I feel like it was care first and tech second. And I was wondering if you'd like to talk about how care is important to you in, in your practice. I think there's two things that I got from Machines Room in that terms of that culture. And they're part, they're, I'd say they're flip sides of the same coin. One is this culture of care. 
um, and the other is a culture of sharing. Um, and um, I think that they're, they're very much part of the same thing, right? So there's there was there was there was an authenticity to the space that we existed in, and it wasn't. I guess it was it was. Um, yeah, we were people first, not just technologists, I think. And I think part of that was because a lot of us came into that space with very different skills and very different talents. Um, and um, and we always made the time to teach each other. Or There was always a culture of you could ask anyone anything. And through that was born um, like a deepness to the community, I want to talk about our relationship here. We had a different, we had like a, an extra dimension. But just even with the people that I wouldn't interact with, that often I would, I would still get that same feeling. Like I would never feel like there was a wrong question that I could ask, and nobody would. You know what I mean? Like it was. Yeah, it was the least judgy space I've ever been a part of. There was like, I. I felt like I could walk up to Ross and be like, I don't understand what that does. And he'd be like, oh, it does this, you know? And I'd be like, oh, it's so cool. Like the 3D printing people would be like, oh, what's this thing? And, and they'd always be like, it's, it's, it's this, is this. People would always have time for you. Yeah. I didn't ever feel like anybody pushed me off. And, and so often, I remember when I was learning to CNC, and particularly uh, Susanna, who's in this space. And I, I was really like, as you know, I have a disability and I really struggle with like anything that involves strength is basically just like, I can't push because I will take a joint out. And I've dislocated my elbows and shoulders more times than I can count. And I, I really just, I'm, I'm tentative with my body and I was really struggling to change the cullet on this machine. And like, I was like, I can't do this. And um. She saw me struggling and she came in with a, a long tube of like saran wrap and she stuck it. Have you ever seen her do this before? She stuck it on the cullet, uh, on the, on the wrench and she attached it to the cullet and she used her hip. And I was like, Oh, what is this? <laughs> and I, she's like, you don't have to muscle it because you can just lean into it. I was like, Oh my God. Poo, too, too. And she's like, yeah, I keep this over here. And I thought to myself, what an amazing moment because like what would it look like if tools were made for hips because we're strongest in our lower body and in our hips and it just the reality she proposed to me there with the thing of saran wrap was just like one of the most delicious realities i've ever had proposed to me in a maker space tools right you know we like tools no it was a fantastic place and i think i think there was this this culture of experimentation there and a culture of, of, of people asking how you were um and, and actually caring about it I think part of that as well, I wonder yeah. if that's this, 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 the way that the space was set up to a certain extent as well. There was like, um, maybe it was just a collection of people there. I have thought about it often because it, you know, like having, having been part of, well, over a dozen makerspaces at this point, it certainly remains to me um, by far the most caring and, um, and, and, and as a consequence, informative makerspace I've ever had the privilege of being part of and because you felt safe because people were caring about you you're more likely to ask a lot of questions do you know what I mean like you felt safe you felt safe in that moment to be like oh to not feel like an idiot to be like oh no I don't know this thing they're gonna judge me um but like, yeah yeah it was, it's, it's it was a really interesting place really interesting a really interesting space um, but yeah, it was. There was this wonderful culture there. Very much, very much enjoyed yeah. that space. I, I, th I think a lot about ability. Yeah, oh, I think a lot about ability with that space because it's the only space I've ever been in it that was a maker space that had people uh, who were not all exactly the same and homogenous. There were so many people with different abilities around this space, like who needed different things, and the space they just made it happen. Like for me. Um, they made a monitor hook. So on my desk, I could hang a monitor, which was like one of my favorite things. 
Um, and everything was up really ergonomically. For Rachel, who was in a wheelchair, they built an accessible toilet. Like they just was like, okay, so we're gonna build one and we're just gonna put it right here. And and people just did that. Like there was never a question about these kinds of things. They just happened. It didn't happen. There was no discussion. There was no, should we black? There was no vote if you want to have access for people. It was just, okay, this happens. It was very much a, ju- a just get on with it culture yeah it's like just yeah. just do it you know and yeah just yeah. just uh, just just put that saran wrap right there. just just make that just make the thing <laughs> yeah just figure it out figure out whatever you need we fix it you know somebody here will help you do it so you can just find somebody it will happen there will be someone here who listens and i just remember like with you we you and i fed back and forth like if i couldn't do a thing you'd do it for me i've got no coordination totally would yeah and that's the yeah. thing like when you'd you be like yeah when you have that community and when you're able to to mm-hmm. use that kind of community you get so much more done as well for sure because everybody's got different abilities and you're just like hey do you know how to do x and I'd be like, oh yeah, I totally know X. And I'd be like, I can't do Y. Can you do Y? And you'd be like, yeah, I can totally do Y. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's such a nice thing. So I thought that would be a really lovely note to wrap on because it really points to all these like things about technology that I think make it better and make a world that we'd want to be in. And I feel like... It's about, adm- you know, it, it's about advancing the sum of human knowledge, right? <laughs> And having a nice time it's before not- we die. <laughs> <laughs> having a nice time before we die. Oh my God, please. I'm so ready for a nice time. I have not, I left New Cross, which is the area I live in for like months. I crossed the bridge the other day because I had to go do a government thing. And I never thought going to a government office would be exciting, but it was like, a roller coaster. I was like, Ooh, I'm out of my house. <laughs> well, this has been wonderful, Helen. Thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate your energy and I'll continue to follow your work from afar now that you've moved to the U S so thank you so much. Thank you for Bye. having me Phoenix. Bye. Bye.